All right, grab your Bibles. Let's get into the study together. We've been doing the book of James. Amen. Take time. If you can, do grab a Bible. And if you can't quite get there, you know I'm going to read the scripture. Amen. So this is part three, the book of James, or chapter three. No, do you all have notes? Yeah. It's nice to have this space down the bottom. <laughs> all right. Amen. So in this book, I call it the Proverbs of the New Testament. And because you guys are so well read and you study, all right, let's go over exactly what, what we've studied so far. For example, in chapter 1, where were the three main themes? Can you remember them in chapter 1? Yes, that's right, Amanda. Number one was, let patience have a perfect work. And we discovered, now, this is something I need to tell you, those may be tuning in first time tonight, is this book is written to the Jewish born-again believer. Okay? This is written to a born-again Jew. Now, Jews were brought up in a different mindset than us Gentiles. And we're not faulting them about anything. But they, they knew the law. They knew the precepts of the law. They knew a lot of things, what the law did, and how they want to follow it, and the different things that they had to go through the sacrifices. So when they get born again, they weren't well read in what to believe as a Jewish believer. So I'm not faulting them. But you're going to see that James writes this without getting specific. And so I'll go back. Let patience have her perfect work. So they're looking at it like, oh yeah, let's, let's let patience have her perfect work. Because what's hidden is whose patience? Jesus. See, it's, it's a Jewish mindset. So they haven't got quite the puzzle yet that God is dwelling in them. They, they ask God to come in them, but it's not a revelation for them just to understand they have God in them. Hello. Amen. So that's why he says, let patience have a perfect work. Right? Then the second thing is in chapter 1. Do you remember? Well, let's just drop it down. Be a doer of the word in what? Yeah. All right. Let's move to chapter 2. All right. What can we, what can we remember in chapter 2? That was just last week. Chapter 2 really talks about not being partial or showing favoritism, right? And we worked it right on down to see what the enemy's doing right now. He's trying to put everybody in a category or a box. You're this. You're a type A personality. You're this and you're that. And so we go to look at them in that mindset, right? Amen. And, and please don't say this. This is a joke. You're a moron. No, <laughs> We do that too. Hello. So we don't want to get in. So chapter 2 is really about not showing partiality to those that have money and those that do not. But we can bring it right on in. See how Satan has got the world divided up into categories. Hello. And if you've ever visited India, I mean... They got everybody for thousands of years in different classes. They don't have a color, you know, prejudice color thing. They class stuff. You're of that class and your whole family can never change. You're of that class. Oh, you're a little bitter class. And that's the way they put people. Who do you think is behind all that? Exactly. And that's why the word works in our heart and up into the eyes of our understanding so that we can operate with the wisdom and the equity. Everyone say equity. Equity, which means balance of life. Can you say amen? All right. So, and also, what was the second theme in chapter 2? Faith without deed, you got it. Faith without works is dead. Amen. You show me your faith, or say you have faith, and I'll show you my works. Hello. Now, we know a lot of people still struggle on this. Works is not what we get God to respond to. Bring God a work, right? So you can work really, really hard, but if God's not in it, stop. 
you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> Find out if God's in it and then go for it. Can you say amen? God wants us active. That's where the works come in. So if we try to earn by works something, we know that doesn't work. So faith, when you have faith in God because we love him, works should follow. In other words, don't just say you're a Christian. People should watch you and see that what you do is Christian-like. It's like Christ. You're kind. You're loving. This is fun. This is a joke. You're liberal in giving. <laughs> Can you say amen? Well, we should be anyway. God gave so much to us. But let's move on. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about your heart and love and caring for one another. All right, see how you are? So, chapter 1, we see a couple of themes. Chapter 2, now we're moving to chapter 3. I love chapter 3 because there's some very powerful truths. Now, remember, this is in the Jewish mindset. So they didn't know that they couldn't cuss out their neighbor. <laughs> okay, now, don't think I'm picking on them. I'm not. I am plus for Jew. But they didn't know because it's an eye for an eye and a what? They were under that kind of thinking. Hello? So in chapter 3, he deals with the tongue. He says, you guys, I don't know if you've ever been to one, but I have when I was in, in Israel. A synagogue. You go into a synagogue and you give respect and everything like that because, you know, you're meeting with God, supposedly. But what they do is they meet and then they stand up after they do all the their things for God. Then they stand up and argue scripture the rest of the day. I don't care what you believe. I, I believe this. Gamaliel said this. You know, and if you ever get into a, a person, maybe a Hasidic Jew that's never really been born again, one of the things they're really good at is arguing. <laughs> so their tongue's a problem. Do you see the problem? Tongues, your tongue, how many know your your tongue and your mouth can get you into problems. And do you suppose that they had that same problem? Standing in the street corner and blowing the trumpet? I would say it was a problem. That's what they're exposed to. Remember, we're a product to our exposure. Can you say amen? And so we want to be not like Lot, who is vexed by looking at the sins of Gom Sodom and Gomorrah, but we want to be so overwhelmed by God that those things we hardly notice or respond or comment on. Say amen. So in that pot, in the Jewish mindset, you need to understand. Okay. All right. So we're going to move into chapter 3. So you go to chapter 3. We're going to pick up at verse 1. I'm going to go to Proverbs as the text. It's in your notes too. Chapter 3. We're going to look, I'm going to give you 13 through 18 in Proverbs. Now remember, Proverbs is in what testament? Oh. And really I'm doing that, you guys know that, but I'm doing that also for those coming in by camera. Okay, it's in the Old Testament. A lot of times people don't filter out the new and the old. We don't throw any of it away. All scripture is given by God. But you see, if you don't understand the historical setting and the context in which it is spoken, and how it is applied there, and how it spiritually applies to us now, then you're going to mess up scripture. And we don't want you to do that. Say amen. All right, so Proverbs 3.13, you go to James. And it says, happy is the man who finds wisdom. See the word finds? you got to look for it. Okay? And the man who gains from it understanding. For her proceeds, look at the her there are better than the profits of silver and are gained than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things that you may desire cannot be compared with her. Length of days are in her right hand. Amen. Do you know what a length of day is? Don't holler it out, dear. PJ, you want to make a stamp? What is the length of days? It has two meanings means live longer, right? But there's a hidden meaning in there. You have to look for it. That means you get all that you need to get done in the day. He lengthens the day. <laughs> so you get some rest. Can you say amen? So God's wisdom, 
What does it do? It shows us how to do the project better, quicker, with more wisdom, and you get done faster than working hard and trying to figure things out. So what do we do? We go to God for wisdom, don't we? If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. All right, so let's move on. Let me just stay right where we're at. And it says, look, riches and honor in her left hand. Okay? Her ways are ways of plentiness. You should be prospering. You guys are in the word. You spend time with God. You should be prospering. Things should be getting better. The outlook of things get better. Why? Because God is adding to your life because his wisdom is operating in you. Amen? Do you know the difference again? Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Knowledge is accumulation of facts. Wisdom is the ability to put those facts to use to get the desired results. And the understanding comes from doing those two things, you get the understanding. So the eyes of God's wisdom and understanding become permanently sealed and locked into your spirit. Amen. Somebody said, well, Pastor Kerry, how do you remember so many scriptures? I don't. There's no memory that I have. <laughs> it was all gone. No, I just through use. You just get used to it after a while. You just get used to it. Now, I would recommend that you pick a favorite translation and stick to it. Okay? But you can use other translations to help. Can you say amen? But all you're doing is switching every day. You're never been able to quote anything. <laughs> Hello? It all sound like a, what the enemy wants it to sound like. Kind of all kind of not, Marge Paul's not put together. Do you understand the plan of man? Do you understand the fault of that plan, not in God's view, but what Satan did to arrest that plan? What did to, Jesus did? Once we get a grasp of an overall look at the plan, it'll keep you from straying away from when you hear different teachings without the mindsets. All right, so let's go back on. It says, besides that, her paths are paths of peace, besides plentiness, and she is a tree of life to those who... Take hold of her. Amen. If you're going on a date and you want to dance, and it's a slow dance, take hold of her if she's your wife. Amen. And happy are all who retain her. Okay. James chapter 3, verse 1. The tongue is a steering rudder. Do you agree with that? Amen. In fact, if you knew how well the tongue could steer your boat you would use your tongue more correctly and concisely, indubitably making sense of what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. You with me? Okay. So James chapter 1. My brethren, now remember, they're scattered about in Palestine. They're freaked out. They don't have enough knowledge of who they are in Christ. The church has just begun. This letter, letter was written in 45 A.D., Paul's writings were in 60, 62 A.D. So this is one of the first letters of the epistles. Are you with me? So he goes, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Hello, everybody wants to tell somebody something. Knowing that we should receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. I think we all could agree that that happens. And if anyone does not stumble in what? In word, he is a perfect man. The Greek word for perfect there is teleos. It simply means mature. Okay? Teleos, come to maturity. In other words, no more toss to and fro. You're not iffy, you're not waddy. You're just together, you and God are friends. That's what it is. It's just realness with God. So he says, look. All right, it goes on and it says, and we all stumble in many things and anyone does not stumble in word, he is a mature man, able also, now listen, this is the key, able also to bridle the whole body. In other words, to control yourself. One of the problems I used to have when I was young as a Christian is I had blurt out -ism. You know, you hear somebody talking and you go, hey, and you blurt it out. 
Somebody's not even talking to you and you blew it out the answer and you weren't even asked the answer. Okay, why are you saying that? I'm just trying to tell you how our tongue could get us in trouble and try to be funny about it. In other words, try to get real serious. Amen, you know. You know, it's like the guy says, you know, we're hung by our tongue, you know, and your, your tongue is like a weapon. And the first thing he says, you know, it just kills me. <laughs> it shows how messed up we are. And so I'm not trying to play heavy on just the confession thing. But there is a lot of wisdom there because James, the half-brother of Jesus, walked with Jesus, saw how Jesus talked and how he walked. And he began to emulate it. It drived him crazy because he was a Jew. And Jesus wasn't quite acting Jewish. He was acting Godish, <laughs> you know. And he wasn't kind of fitting that. So James was the last one of the family who got converted because he thought Jesus was crazy. That's why Jesus had that answer that says, who is my mother and my father? Oh, hey, your mother and father are out there. Your brothers. Who is my mother and my brethren? But he that does the will of God. That's when Jesus said that. James is sitting there going, oh, no, we got to go see the Messiah again. Mom, you know, can you imagine? Come on, let's put it down to modern terms. So James finally gets it all together and, bam, something snaps, and God anoints him. Now, James is the pastor at the church of Jerusalem, but Peter is the apostle, okay? That's the difference. So James is more to the people, He's talking to the congregation here. He's trying to tell Jewish people how to rethink. Rethink things. You need to re be able to speak because don't you know that the word of God abides forever? So if your words are that powerful, you need to speak right. All right, so that's what James is doing. But you look at it and you go, wow, that makes much more sense in a Jewish mindset. Because they were used to blurtism. Hey, and they argue in the scripture. So quick to pick up a stone and throw it at some Gentile. You don't think they had a word problem? Why did they call people dogs? <laughs> God didn't tell them to do that. Yeah, just call the Gentiles dogs, saith the Lord. <laughs> no. Are you with me? Are you having fun tonight? I look at Scott, and I think he's here. No, <laughs> bless your heart. <coughs> I am teasing you, Scott. I love him really much. The only problem is he's going like that. All right. Okay, so let's look at this thing. All right. All right, and he says, look at, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For if we stumble in many things, yes, we will. But if anyone does not stumble in word, there is what, he's what kind of a man? Amen. And you're able to bridle your whole body. Okay. Indeed, it says, we put bits in horses' mouths and that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. Horses are fairly large, aren't they? If they how much you ever had one step on your toe? I did. Thank God it was mud under it. Smashed my foot down about that far. Wow. <laughs> He's going, you think you're smart going to leave me around? <laughs> They're smart. Those horses are smart. So when we put bits in their mouths and we're able to lead their body, you know, around, they're big. And then he changes it and he uses his ship. Ships are even bigger, right? Not a smaller rudder. So let's finish reading. Okay? All right? And look also at ships, although they are so large, they are driven by fierce winds. They are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And I cut it off there in your notes for a minute. We're going to talk about how to steer your life. You ever noticed, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, that people that talk too much get into trouble? And people that talk too negative bring in oppression? Get around somebody that all they've had is hand-me-down. They haven't had a boot up on life. Let's get them to church. Teach them how to prosper. But they don't have a boot in life. And if you listen to the conversation, everything's wrong. And 
I'm hamming it up a bit, please. I'm not picking on anybody. Amen. Martha, Martha. <laughs> and maybe you're tired at the end of the day, but put spark in your voice anyway. You understand? Because Satan, how does he get tipped off? The tone of your voice. Your countenance is drained when you speak negative, and then the light goes dim. And when the light dims, the enemy moves in. So you never want to have a bulb out for any length of time. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Amen. And if you've been like a lot of Christians who don't know any better, they're slapping all kinds of mud on their, their bulb, flesh, blah, 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 going out and partying and acting like the world and doing all that kind of stuff, that if God wanted to shine out, he'd have to clean all that crud off their lens. Moving right along. So the Jewish people, bless their hearts, didn't Jesus say to them, one of the places Jesus rebuked them was in, was in Matthew 23. He says, you are like whited sepulchers. You're so pretty. You smell so good. But I look in you and you're full of dead man's bones. In other words, there's no life in you. And you're telling everybody how to live and you're not even born again. You see, that was the scenario. So let's go on. You guys don't think I'm picking on anybody, do you? Well, gosh, I hope you're not. I'm just picking on me. Remember, I always pick on me, right? You see the big lip coming down there? It doesn't do that anymore. Or I'll tell you the story sometime. Okay, so it says, I love this, and it goes on. So bits and horses, rudders on ships, how we speak can turn our life around. How many here believe that? Come on. Can you think of a scripture, maybe, that by speaking, you turned your life around? You did it. You, you spoke. Can you think of a scripture that says how you turn your life around? Maybe believe in your heart? And confess with your mouth? Didn't that? Yeah? With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto Sozo, or salvation. Now, interesting word, sozo, because if we believe in our heart the word of God, confess with our mouth, we are made unto, and which means salvation is a continual thing that works with us on a daily basis. Salvation has been working on you when you got up this morning. And if you get in the flesh, so will the mystery of iniquity. <laughs> the spirit that now works on the children of disobedience, it says. You can't be a disobedient children if you're not a child. Hello? So let's talk about Christians who are disobedient. So that's not punishing you, but just look at this. So these Jewish people hadn't got it yet. So he says, look, you can control your life. You don't have to drone. You don't have to be fearful of the Roman government or, or the lion's den. <laughs> you don't have to be scattered about. What you need to do is hear my words and pass this letter around. So, are you with me? A couple of points. Don't think to be teachers. You know, people just want to get up there and teach something. Ooh. Listen, the moment I stepped, listen, I want you to pay cl close attention. I'll explain if you need it. The moment I stepped into my office, I took on the office, do you understand? And the responsibility thereof. And as being young greenhorn, I made messes. But the office is holy. Hello. But I'm the man in the office. Well, you have an office. Amen. And you're the person in your office. Make a good go at it and lean on God a lot. Can you say amen? But remember, the office that God puts you in is holy. So when you, for example, when you criticize somebody in an office, you have to go through the office to get to the person. And here's how the devil just loves it. So yeah, maybe somebody is doing something that probably needs to change. But you talking about it to your wife isn't going to cure it. <laughs> or to somebody else about it. It just doesn't do it. And the, the, the thing the devil loves is you're striking the office. So you see how Satan plays? 
Get the legality. When Jesus came to the man, the centurion, he had an office. He was a centurion. And he says, I am a man who gives orders and I take orders. I have soldiers under me and I say, do this, do that. And Jesus came to and appealed to him because he had an office. Jesus didn't burst into his office and say, I'm Jesus. <laughs> and so many Christians do that with their Christianity. That's not correct. The way to do it and grow in the anointing of God where literally people get around you and tremble is by you really watching your mouth and really watch what you do. Okay, say I got it. I'm not preaching or teaching to any of you, although something might fit. So if it does, just smile and don't act guilty. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Point, second point. Can you guys laugh a little? Oh, I'm on. All right. I learned to laugh myself a lot. You know, if you don't, you're going to get, something's going to break. All right, two, when we allow God to help us discipline in our office how we speak, we mature faster. I've talked to people I've known for 40 years. They love the Lord. But what comes out of their mouth, it's like they got just saved. And they haven't learned a thing. Because you can watch somebody. See, I don't like to judge anybody. But if somebody tells me something, I watch them to see if what they say matches up with what they do. Because nowadays, you, you just don't know. I want to trust everybody. And I lost two churches out of it. <laughs> I gave authority to people who just ripped me off. Well, no more. Can you say amen? You want to do it God's way. All right, so let's, let's look at some things, all right? Three, the tongue has death and life in it. Death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. What do you need? Well, the scripture I used earlier, believe in your heart, confession with your mouth, right? Death and life. You spoke life. Life came in. Somebody said, well, how did you get Jesus in your heart? I've been to catechism. <laughs> and great, please go. That's, those things are wonderful. But no, you ask him to come in. Can you say amen? How do you get your prayers answered? You ask him. So you ask, then you got to really believe. And come on, that's your head telling you that. That's not right. You need to be as a child. God doesn't look a little child and a little child. He goes, Daddy, you better believe. <laughs> I was guilty of that. You don't have enough faith, brother. And God told him, rebuked me, and he says, yes, they do. They have me. And I, ooh, sorry. You see, we still try. Now, listen to me carefully, because I don't, there's not much to this lesson tonight, so I'm going to talk. There's still that tendency for us to operate for God physically with our physical strength. In other words, we're working really hard to love God, and that's okay. But that's not going to do it. What's going to do it is obeying God when he tells you and just loving on him. God will make you more active than you've ever been. You get all fired up for God and you won't be able to sit still. Some people, and I've talked to Scott with this and several other people, you know, a lot of people, they just sit and believe. They're professional students of the word. They never do anything. And I agree. We've got to put our feet to our prayers we got to do that. But don't go out there without any wisdom. Don't give people something you really don't have. <laughs> Moving right along. So the tongue has depth and life in it. So what do you say about yourself? Remember the, the, the religious people came out to see John the Baptist? Remember? And they came out and, and John says, what did you come out to see? A, a reed Twisted in the wind? He says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ye straight the paths of the coming of the Lord. Right? But the question they asked him was, Who are you? Are you the Messiah? What do you say about yourself? My question to us is, Who are we? How do we talk about ourselves? How do we present ourselves to others? How do we come across? Christians, 
we, sometimes we get caught up in our Christianity, we, but we're not sensitive enough about how we come across with it. Your fishermen don't have bait with B.O., okay? <laughs> or forget your bait box. Your fishermen, what are we after? The souls of men. He who wins souls is wise. All right, there you go. I think a lot of Christians get in trouble because they stop winning souls and they start correcting one another. Oh. You're not to correct anybody. You say, well, Lord, oh, that, that's not good. You go to God and you pray. And God will step right in and correct. But if you step in, you can get bit. You know? <laughs> Do I not step in sometimes? You just listen to God. God says step in and say something. It's okay. But if you step in and God didn't say so, if you get bit, don't say, God, why did you let that happen? My heart intent was just so pure. <laughs> Can you say amen? Boy, you got such a serious look on your face. I just make a, want to make sure I'm not offending you. Bless your heart. And Billy, you behave back there. All right. All right. So, so let's go on. In, in, in verse 5 through 12, we have two springs and we're not talking about, we're talking about water. I, I love talking the word of God with people. I love for people to come over and let's just talk the word. Okay, you know, we'll sit in the scripture, bring up, and let's talk about it. Let's read something, you know. And, and so we have two springs in us. Can you say amen? We have a salt spring called our flesh. And we have a pure spring in our spirit with God in it. Can you say amen? And it says, wisdom in the heart of man is like deep waters, but a man of understanding will dip it out and bring it up to the eyes of their understanding. It's in, the, in Proverbs. So we got wisdom in us because we have God in us, but a lot of times we're not tapping the source of God. Rather, we're speaking whatever comes to mind. Another form of blurtism. Amen? I'm just going to give you a piece of my mind. Please don't. <laughs> Amen. But we all want to because we're so right. Okay, so let's go on. Now, I got to stop right here. There's, there's tenseness. There shouldn't be any tenseness tonight. I'm not pre preaching to any of you. And, unless your underwear's hanging out. And Kenneth Copeland used to say when you, a rock is thrown into the parking lot, it's full of dogs. They're all happy. The only one's going to yelp is when you hit. So don't yelp tonight. Teaching you the word of God. This is Pastor James. Realize it's very advanced. Okay. So that means, oh Lord, help me with that. Thank you kind of stuff. Okay. Because you don't want me to preach some happy word. You know, you know slap you on the back to so be warmed and filled. <laughs> and have me get in trouble. All right. So let's go on. Amen. Well, we just quit one. I remember it's a short lesson tonight. So let's go on. So. It says, James chapter 3, verse 5. Even so the tongue. It's a little member, but boasts great things. Now, how many know we brag on God? It's okay. We don't boast on ourselves. Say amen. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? And sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. Who's the prince of darkness? Satan. So who gets the tongue a-going? Proverbs says that the way man's wired is that sometimes gossip is like tantalizing goodies that people love to nibble on. It's, it's odd. Oh, tell me it. People will call you up in prayer. Hey, D. Oh, I got to tell you, so-and-so needs prayer. And Dee says, but I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> Just tell me what they need, you see. Oh, I mean, I've trained so many prayer sessions and so many prayer lines, so many, all kinds of things. Just hundreds of things like that. But in a prayer line, one of the problems we get in trouble is wanting to know too many details. And then after we hear and pray about it, we tell someone else when we sinned right there. Okay. That tongue part opens and shuts things 
Amen. For example, if you don't agree with your husband and wife at home, the Bible says your prayers are instantly hindered. Get your arguments and everything dealt with. So when you pray, you have agreement. But if you get this scrapping and everything like that, your prayers are almost all shut down, no matter how good you are, until you say, forgive me, dear, forgive me, dear, forgive me, God, you see. And Jews never knew this. They just get mad at somebody and disown them. You went and get, became a Christian? We're having a funeral for you. That's how they were. So they were brought up as hard and nasty. And here Pastor James is trying to get to the crux of how Christians kill themselves. With the little rudder of their mouth. Amen. What's the Bible say? Um, Ephesians 6, Colossians 4. If you're disobedient to your parents, your life is shortened. So if you get sassy and bossy, it's rebellion. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. So all of this stuff we're supposed to know like the back of our hands. But the Jewish people didn't know that. So let's move on. So James, bless his heart. Okay, so now it says that it's a fire, a world of iniquity, set on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire by, the, by, the, by hell itself. For every kind of beast, bird, reptile, creature of the sea is tamed. It has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. Period. Did you see that? So, I'll really be, I'm really, really sorry. I'll never say that again. <laughs> Better go to God. The so promises are kept as long as Jesus is Lord of that promise. We're talking about personal walk. You guys rather hear about the end times? <laughs> How about we talk about finances? <laughs> I'm even more quiet. <laughs> anyway, this is all good stuff. It helps us mature and grow right. I mean, there's all kinds of growth. There's growing out. There's growing up. Amen. There's cancer. There's a growth. Hello? And the word will cure all of that. Say amen. Okay, so... We've tamed beasts, we tamed that, but no one can tame the tongue. Okay. It says, out of the same. It says, why is it that we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men? Remember, Jewish mindset. They think nothing. I went to Israel. I love the Israelites. I'm going to Israel. I'm a tourist. You're supposed to treat the tourists nice. I was treated like a king everywhere except for this little Jewish jewelry store I went to. And I made the mistake of bringing up Jesus. And she almost hit me with a bat and screamed at the top of her lungs and drove me out of this little box of a jewelry place. Sometimes you got to know what to do and when to do it. Amen. Man, that wasn't a very good experience with me. But the Jewish people are wonderful. But they're used to all of this hate towards them. The Semiticness. We, Hitler murdering them, Mosley. Look, why? Satan hates the Jews. Perfect blood sacrifice for Hitler to sacrifice the Jews to Satan, his God. Read more on Hitler. You probably could use it. And so we don't repeat ourselves in our nation. Do you tell me what I have to do to be a citizen of this nation? You work for me, government. And there's enough of us that are just being quiet right now that you better get into the line. I mean, we're talking about more than 75 million. Okay? Everybody's had enough. So we're just praying. We're learning this lesson here. Okay, so here we go. A couple of points. The tongue is a small member, right? So we should be able to control it. Not with God's, without God's help. Because it just wants to react. You're connected to your brain and connected to your spirit. We need to operate and speak from our spirit, but our brain often at times interrupts, blurts out, 
thinks things. I mean, maybe you haven't seen somebody and they gained some weight. How do you keep your brain from looking at them and saying, man, you see what I'm saying? That's a discipline, isn't it? Sure. I remember when I had, you know, weight is not a thing. God is, hey, you know, if you're not going to deal with it now, you'll shed it when you go up. <laughs> yeah. And some of you skinnies, I see you, Billy. Amen. You're going to gain when you go up. You're going to become perfect. Anyway, all right, let's move on through this and we'll be done. Okay, so the tongue is a small member. Let's control it by God to only God in us can tame our tongue if we allow him to. So how would you do it, Pastor Kerry? I go to him and say, Lord, I found myself being a little rude today. And I ask you to begin to just take it from me. Move it out of me, Lord. I'm just going to sit and worship you. And I know that if I ask, you'll do it. And so I'm going to take my mind off of that and put my mind on caring for you. And he works it while you're not even aware of it. I mean, I would even venture to tell you, he could remove it in your sleep. The key is, he's got to get you out of the way. Because we like to hold on sometimes. Well, we don't mean to, but we like to. All right, so let's go on. Three, we are to bless people, not curse people. I want to tell you this. I learned this the hard way. Don't curse the devil. You're not tough enough. Just say the Lord in me curses you. Amen. Say it that way. I take authority in Jesus' name over you. Okay, make sure Jesus is involved. When Michael, the archangel, in confronting with Moses' body, when he confronted the devil, he says, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, he didn't rail at him. He didn't antagonize him. He had all the power. He could have just made a display out of him. But he says, the Lord rebuke you. So what... You are, you're a, a carrier of God. So when you rebuke the devil, you don't have to display demonstratives. You can just go, in Jesus' name. The most powerful deliverance sessions I've ever been in, I whispered the name of Jesus and just let God out. And God and his angels just ripped that thing right out of there. It's the most amazing thing I never saw. Everybody else was yelling and screaming, <laughs> wearing out their voices. Fighting the devil. And the devil's going, isn't this great? Look at the clowns. <laughs> Ooh, let's get some popcorn. <laughs> That's exactly how he looks at it. You got to get with people and get some training if you want to know. It's okay. It's not any hard thing. But you got to know what working. These Jewish people had no idea the, the concept God indwelling them. All the time they heard through their whole walk in the Old Testament, God wants to tabernacle amongst men. God wants to come live amongst men. And we groan waiting for that time. Now Jesus has come. And he's not only tabernacling amongst us in the air we breathe, but he's dwelling in us and he's clothing us. <laughs> Put on the garment of praise, the robes of righteousness, Armor of light, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? You're getting all that out of James? Of course. James walked with Jesus. He knew how Jesus said. Do you think Jesus ever screamed at the devil? So next time you feel like you're under attack, submit to God, resist the devil, and what happens? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't seem much screaming to me. I'm trying to tell you some of the deceptions Satan uses. The louder, the tougher, sometimes no, not necessarily. Unless you're an evangelist. And that's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Everyone say, got it. Say, I bless God. All right. So James 3, 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Everyone say, Jesus. Amen. We would like to think ourselves wise. But the Bible cautions us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. All right? So, here we go. Who is wise and understanding among you? Who has enough knowledge of the word to understand what I'm going to tell you? 
Let him show by a good conduct what you do, that the works are done in meekness of wisdom. What you do for God should be done in meekness, not and wisdom. Say amen. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Stop comparing to others. Can you say amen? Some Jews hated other Jews. You could go four blocks in Jerusalem or any Jewish town and people talk a different Jewish language. They have a Jew different Jewish synagogue and a different Jewish teacher. Could they all get along together in the synagogue? No. <laughs> they tried. But you know, how well can all of us get along in the flesh? And for how long? You see, you see the psychology? So here these people are, oh, we want it all work and all that. Why are people hating us? And James is saying, stop. Get hold of your mouth. Begin to understand that God lives in you now. Let God have his perfect work. You stop judging on who's rich and who's going to help you out of your problem. Instead, you trust God and let God guide your steps. Don't go to the rich. Don't stay away from the poor. You go to whomever God sends you. All right. I don't preach myself happy. So, so it says the wisdom. It's a, it's, but if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly. Look at the next word. Sensual of the senses and demonic. It's Satan's wisdom. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing are there. So if you're thinking about your stuff, your thing, and you're right, you're going to have a big pile of problems. You're going to bring it in on yourself. So Jewish people, believers, let's get a hold of the word. But the wisdom that is from above, say above. We heard about another scripture. The gift that comes from above is first perfect. Good, right? The wisdom that's from above is what? First, pure. Then peaceable. Then gentle. Willing to yield. Do you know what that means? If somebody just has to have a say, let them have a say. Wisdom's not moved by that. Wisdom sits and, and studies by God's grace a situation, and then the Spirit of God says, now say this. That's how wisdom operates. And suddenly the whole thing changes. The other day, um, I was at my little friend's, I won't mention his name, but nobody was happy. Nobody was moving around. Nobody was introducing everything. And I says, God, I made a mistake of saying this. God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to do something? He says, yeah, get up, be happy. Amen. So I did. He probably all thought it was nuts, but... I just do what God says. I'm not going to figure out why he says it. Just look like everybody could use a, a little laughter. Hello. And they were doing fine, I'm sure. But hey, let's so spark it up a little bit. Amen? Isn't that what you used to do in the party time? Young lady. You, Billy, behave yourself. All right, so let's move on. All right, read, read on with me. Okay, so it says, it's peaceful, gentle, pure, it without partiality, see, no partiality, no favoritism, and without hypocrisy. Listen, just mean what you say, say what you mean. Don't try to be something. Listen, I love you for who you are. It's all the bragging and all the trying to impress all that stuff. All kinds of, kind of falls in on itself. Well, none of you do that, but it can do that, right? You, get, you ever been to a ministerial meeting? I'm sure some of you have. One of the things I used to always hate is everybody dropping names. Who they preached with, who they hung around with, what they played with, which people, you know, I'm thinking, man, I don't want to get into this. So I wore jeans and a sweater the next time I went. <laughs> Forget the suit. Let's move on. Enough of this nonsense stuff. All right. Finishing up, everybody. He's finishing. So, are you guys wise now? 
You got James' wisdom. And now we're going to ask God to help us through this. Here's a couple of points. Number one, we are to show with wisdom how we do things. Amen. In a meekness. Meekness means you could be a real strong person, but you use only what's needed for the time. Can you say amen? All right. Two, if envy and self-seeking become a motive for doing things, don't. They are inspired by the devil. In case and confusion, I mean, every evil work shows up there. Thirdly, wisdom from above, Jesus isn't he the wisdom from above? Amen. You see, the Jewish, remember, Jewish mindset. So it's wisdom from above, like Proverbs, like Solomon had it. But now they have Jesus, okay? Pastor James trying to teach the congregation who they are in Christ, okay? And it says, wisdom from above, Jesus in our hearts is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, Without partiality for, without hypocrisy, righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Don't make an argument. Make peace. Say, listen, I don't probably understand what you're saying, but is it really important for you to be right? <laughs> Sometimes. Because normally they're, you know, they never get heard, so when they're going to do it, you know, let's go up there and do something. All right, so finally five the Jewish mindset didn't understand being born again fully. And that's why Paul write, wrote, and that's why Peter, and we have the epistles, so that the realm of understanding who we are in Christ and the new walk in Christ, we could walk. Can you say amen? So Jewish mindset didn't understand the born again. But now they also didn't understand there were two of them. Amen. I thought we were schizophrenic. How you doing? All right. You have a flesh part and you have a spirit part. You just got to realize that's nothing strange. You always had that. The trouble is both were on the wrong side before. Now you got God in there and the Adamic nature or the fallen nature was removed. God lives in you. Now there's teaching out in this area that teaches you when you get born again, God comes into one part of your spirit. And you're over in here and you're part of your spirit. And of course, the fallen nature is taken out. So God in your spirit is facing you in your spirit. Yip, 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 yip. No. Here's what it's like. How do you know? Because God showed me. Ooh. He says, it says become one new creature in Christ. Doesn't it say that? Didn't say two oddities in your spirit. <laughs> Crazy stuff. These people that overstudy Greek and Hebrew all the time kind of get things messed up. And they don't agree with each other either. <laughs> I want to stay to the simple, simple where revival breaks loose. So anyway, the two know when you come in and accept Jesus, the, the, the fallen nature in your spirit we got from Adam, God removes it and replaces it with his very nature, his very presence. It's actually, one of the Hebrew words is essence. It's like an essence. Like you can look at a flower and you can touch a flower, but then there's the essence of the flower. It's not a new agey term, although they're trying to borrow it. It simply means the fullness of the beauty of God. And he took your spirit and God's spirit and mingled them. So they're inseparable. So if you ever have come close to believing this stupid cliche, once saved, always saved, which is a terrible cliche. It means that if God grafted your spirit like that and made you one with him, then do you, do you think it's so easily for you to lose your salvation? Can you? I'm going to tell you. It's all on the play of words. You can't lose your salvation, but you can give it away. So that would be losing, wouldn't it? But it would be a better word to say, I don't want it anymore, God, go back. You're the only one that can say that, but the Bible says there isn't anybody can take Jesus out of your heart. So I want you to be more con concerned about your walk. 
If God came into our spirit and your spirit and they mingled and Satan has been removed out of your spirit, then you are one. Now, sin will separate you from God if you play with it. But I don't think anybody's foolish enough in this room to do that. Say amen. All right, so let's look at some scriptures of the tongue. Ecclesiastics chapter 5. This one's great in the Message Bible. Verse 1 through 3, listen to what it says. It says, Walk properly or prudently when you go into the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. What do you suppose that is? Talking too much. Come in the church, they don't know you, and you know it all. I did that once. Only once. <laughs> I was kicked out of the church. <laughs> I knew more than the elders, and they didn't want anybody to know that. It's kind of like our government doesn't know what's flying around our head, but you and I do. We know it's demons. Hello. Amen. I love that rolling of the eyes. That's really good. <laughs> All right, so listen to that. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let your heart, don't let it be easily uttering anything hastily before God. For God is not in heaven and you are, excuse me, for God is in heaven and you are on the earth. Therefore, let your words be few. How many should we speak? Few. For a dream comes, I love this part, through a much activity and a fool's voice is known by many words. Ah! <laughs> yep. Yeah. I asked God one time, I said, what, what's one of the keys to moving in more power? I said, what am I doing wrong? I always ask God, what am I doing wrong? I don't want to walk around waiting for somebody to tell me. <laughs> I asked God, what am I doing wrong? Because he's going to be gentle with his son. He's going to tell me like it is, though, so I, I understand it. Right? And, then, and when he does, you know, he says, son, you talk too much. You need to slow it down there. <laughs> Gee, God, thanks. <laughs> Ding. All right, so Proverbs, uh, I love this, 16 to listen to what it says. Should be in your notes. It says, the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. Proverbs 18, 20, 21. We know this one quite well, all of us. A man's stomach shall be satisfied with the fruit of its mouth. For the produce of the lips he shall be filled. Now that sounds like food, doesn't it? But it's just saying your life will be filled with your words. If you're speaking up and down every day, dying, crying, whining, buying, you know, you're going to get filled with it. And all your head will be able to think about is that. People who have been trained in poverty have a hard time getting out of it because they can't break that mindset. They need to be in the scripture where it can break it for us and God helping us break through it. You know, we call it welfare mentality where we think we always need a handout and that's not so. Or we're a victim. I'm a victim. And you see it, people feeding off of that. So let's move on. All right, so you'll be filled with the fruit of your mouth. And it says, death and life are in the power of the what? The tongue, and those who love it eat its fruit. So whatever is out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth's going to slip. You're going to speak it. Proverbs 21, 23, whosoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. I like that one. And then Proverbs 12, 14, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth and by the, in, excuse me, by the, I got a hiccup, hiccup, and by the recompense of the man's hands, he will be rendered unto him. So in other words, it'll be given to you what you say and how you act, and, and so it'll be given back unto you. So guess what? You have the power with God's directive to control the destiny of your life. If you got something out of it tonight, will you give the Lord a praise? Yay!